And welcome to Habs Unfiltered, episode 193. I'm your host, Blaine Putbank. I'm joined by my co-host, Matt Smith. Good evening. And we are joined now by special guest, Mike Camito, author, podcaster, writer extraordinaire. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure. It's a shame that it took this long to get you back on, but you are one busy man. You know, yeah, it's been a busy couple of weeks. I think I've done a number of podcasts, uh, which I'm thankful for always for those invitations to, to have me come on and plug the book and share my thoughts. So yeah, it's, uh, it's an exciting time when when there's something to to kind of talk about. So I mean, I've been it's been a whirlwind since the book came out last week, and uh, no end in sight. So pretty happy about that. So for those who don't know, Dundurn Press just released your second book, Hockey 365: A Second Period. So. Um, I believe that is available online and at all major bookstores as well, is it not? Yeah, wherever you wherever you like to buy books, you can probably pick up a copy if you like to, you know, visit your local bookseller. Uh, if they don't have it, you can ask them to bring it in for you. Otherwise, uh, in Canada, it's available at the Chapters or Indigo, uh, and of course on Amazon as well. Now, for those who may not uh, may not have read your first one, can you give them an idea of what kind of layout you give in these books? Yeah, so there, uh, it's it's 365 short hockey history stories, one for every day of the year. Um, I always, after this, usually add the caveat that there's actually 366 stories because I account for leap years. Uh, so there's always that leap day in there, but Hockey 366 obviously doesn't have the same ring as Hockey 365. Uh, but basically, it kind of it ties into notable anniversaries or milestones uh, on a on a given day uh, throughout the year. And so the first book um, obviously dealt with the you know really I had a blank canvas to kind of work with choosing 366 different moments in hockey history the book is called hockey 365 but it's largely drawn from the NHL there are some moments that kind of uh, exist outside of the game outside of the league's uh, history uh, there's some international moments and women's uh, hockey moments as well uh, but for the most part it is kind of focused heavily on NHL history uh, so for the second book it's the same format uh, just obviously building off of the first one where all of those 366 stories that were in the first period are off the table so i had to come up with 366 news stories to fill uh, this volume which was which was a lot of fun obviously as a, as a hockey as a hockey fan you get to kind of pick and choose and stroll down memory lane and see uh, see what you want to write about now what was one story just the, like that one that really really excited you to add to the book to the new book yeah yeah, so um, I mean, I think no, going into the book, um, there was one story that I knew I was going to add, um, like from years ago before I even got this book uh, as an idea to do the second period. I had a tweet that went viral um, probably about three years ago, leading up to the Grammys. It was a, a tweet about Ariana Grande getting hit by a puck at a Florida Panthers game. And then later that game, her parents bought her uh an auction ticket to ride the Zamboni. And so that was still to date the biggest tweet I've ever had. Um, so for, because of that, I'm like, well, I should probably put that in the book if I ever write a second, a second volume. Right. So um, I did that story. So instead of, you know, probably a more notable moment in the game's history, I chose to, to include that in there. And so uh, the fun thing about writing that story was I tried to include as many song titles from Ariana Grande in the story. So it definitely reads a little clunkier than maybe some of the other stories because I'm trying to shoehorn in those song titles wherever I can. I think I managed to put in, I don't know, I want to say 12. Uh, don't quote me, but uh, but yeah, it was, it was fun. I mean, there was a lot of stories in the book that were fun, but I think that was one where because of the notoriety I got with that particular tweet, I'm like, that's I kind of have to put that in there. So that was one where I earmarked it right away saying, we'll find a way to include that in there, even if it meant having to kind of jettison, you know, another story that happened on that day. But you know, there'll be a third period, so I can probably find uh, whatever story was was shelved for that one. I can throw that back in there. So you basically Tra dad Trag is actually Trag is going to yeah. love that story because yeah. Ariana Grande is pretty much his whole playlist at the gym, right? So yeah, it is. He's yeah, gonna love true. it. He's gonna love it. So well. <laughs> with with uh, with the second book, you said you know obviously we've got 365, 366 days of um, of hockey history. Were there days that you maybe started to write a story about one thing and then you're like, I have a better story and then totally scrapped it and then went into something else? Yeah, no, there was definitely a few of those. Um, there was one story where um, because I was writing this like in, in the summer of the, I guess, the first wave of the pandemic still, um, 
And so there was stuff that had happened that hockey season that I didn't really think about because I hadn't really, you know, I was, we were living it as it was happening. Right. So it wasn't usually the, in the standard tweets I would send out every day, which is where I usually got a lot of my information from. So like for February 22nd, um, I forget what story I actually wrote. It was, I forget what the original story was. And then at some point in the summer, I remembered that the David Ayers story happened um, against the Leafs against the Hurricanes. <laughs> and I was like, well, I have to put that in there. So I ended up chucking whatever story that was. And I wrote a story about, you know, David Ayers coming into that game, ultimately becoming the first, you know, e-bug in NHL history to win a game. Um, so that was one example. Um, there was another example where I had written a story about, um, you know, when the wild fired GM Paul Fenton. And I think I was, I didn't really, I didn't really like that one because I think at the time, you know, we looked back at, at Fenton's moves and, you know, it was like kind of, uh, he, he got panned for a lot of the stuff that he had done, but obviously I think in the last couple of years, like the wild aren't, you know, I think necessarily as, as hamstrung as maybe we thought they would be after he left. And so I didn't really want to leave that one in there because, you know, I think ultimately you can criticize the moves that he made while he was there, but ultimately I think over time, you know, you'll kind of evaluate some of those trades and say maybe we were too harsh on some of our evaluations. So I got rid of that one just because I never really felt good about it anyway. Uh, and I replaced it with a story about Kelly Rudy retiring uh, and then obviously going to the broadcast booth, which was a little bit more, I think, you know, the tone of the book, you know, the tone tries to be obviously factual, but also fun and a little bit lighthearted. So um, I thought that was a better fit, uh, but certainly, you know, as a Leafs fan, I had to, you know, I had to put that in there uh, as much as obviously that was like the focal point of that season. Um, you know, I think it, uh, as we look back on the historical record, I think that'll obviously still be something we're talking about in, you know, five, 10, probably 50 years from now. So. So there's a lot of Zamboni based stories. Yes, there is. Well, I mean, in the first book I had, I had the, I had the story about Frank Zamboni who obviously invented the Zamboni. Um, I celebrated, uh, I think it was his birthday that I used and kind of made an argument that, you know, he should be in the hockey hall of fame, which he's not, which is pretty criminal. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's complimentary there that in the second period that there's still some uh, Zamboni tie-ins there. So <laughs> now you obviously didn't have time to add too many have stories as there hasn't been much going on in history for the Canadians lately, but you had a few. So what's, what's one that, uh, that kind of sticks out for you? Yeah. So I think one that was interesting for me, uh, kind of going into the writing process was, there's that story, you know, about uh, Maurice Richard scoring eight, eight points in a game, you know, five goals, three assists. And uh, the context of that story is that he did it the same night, you know, after he moved his family into a new place across town. And it's been immortalized in the Heritage Minute. You've got, you know, the actor who looks like very similar to Maurice Richard, like lugging up furniture up this spiral staircase. And obviously anyone who's been through a move knows that it's the worst. Uh, and the last thing you want to do at the end of moving in all day is, is, is go in for a shift, whether it's on the ice or in the office. And so I wanted to include that in there because obviously it was a historic night. It was a record setting evening for him. Uh, and I think in the context of what he did that day, it was pretty notable. But during the research, research for that, I kind of, I, I came across a story that Dave Stubbs, uh, who does some great work in the history realm for NHL.com. He wrote a story uh, just not that long ago, actually, about how he had discovered that, you know, maybe I think 10 or so years after that had happened, or maybe it was 20 years after that happened, uh, Richard gave an interview with the French language newspaper. And he actually said that he didn't do the move the day of the game. He did it the day before. And so I don't think it diminishes his accomplishment whatsoever because eight points in the game is still pretty incredible. Uh, but I think obviously as a historian, um, I wanted to kind of try to be as accurate as possible. So I included the reference there that the work that Dave had done to find that out. And again, I think hockey history is interesting like that, that I think things that we take for granted oftentimes get mythologized. And, and I think that's part of the appeal about hockey history. Uh, but I think that as, as historians and, and storytellers, we obviously have the obligation to try to, you know, be, be correct with the record when we can. And, and like I said, uh, you know, he could have, he could have sat on the couch all day and scored eight points and it would still be an incredible night. Uh, but I think it also just makes him a little more human that we can all, you know, kind of appreciate the fact that at the end of a day of moving, if all you did was crack a cold beer, uh, and admire your work, then I think you're doing okay. Matt, you got uh, you got a question? So you've had quite a few um, people that have that have reviewed your book or that have said some very good things about both of your books, actually. Um, 
maybe can you share maybe some that maybe surprised you or some of the ones that uh, you kind of took to heart a little bit more than the others? Yeah, I mean, I've been fortunate enough that people have been very generous with their time to even look at the book, let alone offer up some nice words about it. Um, I think that's always the scariest part as an author when, you know, after you've been working on something for over a year, uh, there's really only like an inner circle at the publisher or maybe within your family who's seen the stuff that you've written. And then once you kind of ask people to start reading it for you uh, with the hope that they like it, uh, that's really the first time it's been out in the world. And so you never know if someone's going to read it. You're obviously not going to please everybody. Um, but, uh, but I think the fact that I was able to get, you know, to get the attention of, I think, a lot of people in the hockey world who I've admired for a long time, uh, and just even to have them agree to read it, even if they didn't offer up, like, any positive endorsement, the fact that they were willing to, like, take the time out of the day to talk to me, somebody that most of these people have never met before, or have ever interacted with, um, you know, honestly means the world. Uh, so like, I'm always grateful for that. Uh, the nice thing, you know, I think with both books is that uh, you always get like, there's at least some person who gets their, their comments on the back of the book. Um, you know, and, and in this book, there's, there was actually quite a few that we included in the inside. But I mean, the, the first book, I had Frank Saravelli on the back, which is great, obviously. Uh, but this, this time I had Ron McLean, which obviously for me, um, you know, growing up, you know, that's it's always been a name that's been large for me. And so I mean, you know, he said that looking forward to a game and circling the date on the calendar is great, but I'll take making a date to read Mike Tomito in the greatest games any day. Uh, so that, you know, that's, that's one for me, but again, anybody who offered some kind words for the book, I appreciate everything they did, but I think having Ron McLean, you know, uh, on the back of this book uh, is, is really the icing on the cake. Is it because you were concerned that maybe Frank Cervelli would have uh, leaked your book like he did the Kraken's uh, <laughs> expansion draft? Yeah, well, luckily, I Frank actually Frank read this book again. Uh, he also also offered some nice words. Uh, that was before the expansion draft, though. So I think that was that was before all that. But yeah, certainly now I think if there's a third period, uh, that will be online before it hits bookshelves. Yeah, <laughs> on his Twitter account. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, and on this um, day he wrote this story. Yeah, here's every story of every day. <laughs> My crack and release. Yeah. Um. But uh, your uh, your method for writing the book. I mean, you're a busy guy. You work full time at Cambrian College. You 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 write for the LA Kings. Um, I mean, you, you got your family. Uh, it's not like you don't have. It's not like you have a a well of time. So how did you how did you go about doing this? Yeah, no, that's that is the that's I think the juggling act that that a lot of us do. Um, but I think because we're all passionate about hockey, we find the time to carve it out in our lives to do it. But, but truthfully, I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic, um, at least early on, was it, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because the work that I was doing for the Kings and the Wolves was kind of put on hiatus because we didn't really know when hockey was going to come back. Obviously, we knew that the NHL season resumed in, in August, but the Kings weren't part of that, that playoff picture. So um, I kind of finished my last story for them around March. And then they kind of told me you're going to be kind of like furloughed indefinitely. Same, same with the wolves because we didn't know when they were coming back. And so I thought that I hadn't planned on writing the book when I did, but I figured with so much time that I wouldn't be working on Kings or wolves stuff. Like this was the time to do a book. I think the challenging part about being a writer and an author is that book projects take up so much time and it takes years for them to reach, you know, an audience to read it. Whereas like an article you can spend, a day or two writing it and then the next morning somebody can read it and, and you can talk about the story that you wrote so you get that immediacy that you don't get with a book uh so i always was careful that whenever i'd write my next book i would obviously have to balance my like my online writing commitments and because they were kind of shelved at the time i thought there's no better time i'm not going to get like a like a four month window um or even longer than that right because i knew that the kings weren't going to play in the playoffs so they they weren't going to really have any uh any room for me to do some writing. So it was really like this big block of time that I had that I thought if I'm going to do the second book, like now's the time. Um, my wife likes to joke that, you know, I, I like to joke that I asked my wife for permission to do the book or that we talked about it, but she just says I went ahead with it anyway, which did present some challenges throughout the pandemic. We had our second, uh, our second daughter uh, last March. So, you know, while I was in the middle of writing the book, you know, she was only a few months old. We all, we all made it work and the book's out and everybody's, everybody's, uh, you know, doing well now but uh it, it's, it's stressful sometimes trying to balance obviously your job your family and, and your side projects but but i do think that the timing you know just kind of worked out for the best and i jumped on the opportunity matt 
So speaking of the Kings, you've heard that uh, Quentin Byfield is going to be missing some time. Do you want to uh, you want to touch on that a little bit and give us your opinion? Yeah, that was uh, that was tough news to wake up to. Um, I hadn't stayed up to watch that game that night, and um, it it happened to be um, I forget we were. It was like that same day. Um, Cam Robinson was doing, I think, some projections for players in the NHL that year. Um, he wasn't, I don't think he had published somebody, he'd done the data or he'd done the work to put the numbers together. And so that night I remember asking him, like, what, what's your projection for Byfield uh, for this year? And I think he said like 16 goals and 42 points, which is, you know, pretty decent for hopefully what would have been a full campaign for him as a rookie. Um, and then that night, you know, he goes down with an injury. If you see the video, it's like it's not a very good video. I think everybody knew who watched it either that night or the next day that like, this was not going to be like a, a minor injury. So then, you know, to find out later that he's got a fractured ankle and he's out indefinitely uh, is, is just tough. Obviously he's got such a promising career ahead of him. I think he was obviously slated to potentially start the season with the Kings. Um, you know, he'd obviously done some, he had played some six games with the Kings last year and I think did well with the rain. Um, but again, obviously as somebody who I've watched for a number of years now, starting with his uh, junior career here in Sudbury, um, he's somebody who I have a close eye on uh, to see what he does with the Kings. And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's tough for sure. And I think, especially with the way that things are kind of gearing up for the Kings, um, you know, I think this season, it seems like it's a year where they could try to, you know, battle for a playoff spot and get back into that contention window. Uh, it would have been nice to see Byfield start with them and, and see what happens. But I think obviously, you know, he's young, he's strong, he'll, he'll bounce back. Um, but obviously not the way that any Kings fan uh, would like to see the season unfold at the beginning. I know some Wolves fans are kind of hoping he goes back to Sudbury and joins Quentin Musty to team up. Yeah, you two Qs on one team. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, I, I'm excited to see the Wolves. Obviously, it's been um, you know a couple of years now. I think the last time I went to a Wolves game uh, was February 2020, um, and so I'm, I'm excited to see what they're doing. They just announced their leadership group yesterday. Uh, so Jack Thompson, who's a Tampa Bay prospect, is the captain this year. Uh, and, and Chase Stillman, who was drafted by the Devils this past year, is one of the assistants. So um, it'll be great to get back in that old barn uh, and see what, see what they can do this season. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it was it was kind of unfortunate not to be able to see Quinton finish his career, um, you know, in, in Sudbury, given what happened, uh, you know, last year and whatnot. Uh, now we'll uh, we'll shift back to uh, the NHL. But did you get a chance to watch the All or Nothing series? As a Leafs fan, <laughs> I did. So, ask. yeah, I uh, it, I guess it came out on Friday, and um, I started watching it Friday night. Uh, got into a couple beers and thought that I think I'm just going to watch this whole thing tonight. Uh, so it's it's funny because I rarely rarely stay up late unless unless it's the night where I'm playing hockey, and I obviously come home late. Uh, but it just so happened that the the one night in I can't even remember how long I've stayed up late. You know, my daughter woke up in the middle of the night with a fever, and then we were up. Um, you know, for a few hours. So it almost made it even worse that I picked that night to watch all, all or nothing. I mean, obviously, I've, I've heard some Leafs fans who are saying I'm, I'm not going to watch it. And, and I, I respect that. I think that we've all lived through that, that, you know, that car crash, as, as you might want to call it, the uh, playoff round. But obviously, you guys have a different perspective than I do. But I enjoyed it. I mean, I thought it was obviously really well produced. Um, I like some of the insights that you got to some of the players and personnel. Obviously, I don't think you got like complete you know, look behind the curtain, obviously, but I think you still got some interesting tidbits there, you know, just around Sheldon Keith's philosophy. Um, I love Joe Thornton still, um, obviously he's with Florida this year, but I think you got a window a little bit more into his personality and just kind of see how much he loves the game and how much he loves being around the guys. Um, but yeah, as much as it's painful to, to have uh, relived that final moment, I think honestly, the more painful thing was not obviously the outcome because the outcome, you know, as a Leafs fan, I went into that, series fully expecting that this could go the other way and even after they got that 3-1 lead I remember you know my father-in-law who's a Arden Habs fan was like well, I guess this series over I'm like I don't know which team you're talking about but I've been a Leafs fan for my entire life and I would not be saying that if I was if it was me saying this because I've been down this road before but the hardest part was obviously seeing the Tavares injury again um that was I think the probably the toughest part of that documentary but certainly I think um you know, you, you could see how they might have thought that this year would have been a great year to have all this access. But, you know, I think either way, it was, it was, still, a, it was still well done. But obviously, as a Leafs fan, um, it's not something you're going to be like, I can't wait to watch this documentary, right? Which is, you know, I think as, yeah. uh, as for, for non-hockey fans and non-Leafs fans, I'm not really sure 
like who the market for this would be now. I think obviously they thought that if the Leafs went on a run, you know, you could pull in some other, you know, non-hockey fans who might want to follow some of the players. Uh, but I think, you know, this is largely a documentary for Leafs fans. And uh, I think we've had a lot of heartache over the years. And, you know, it's not as exciting to turn it on and be like, okay, let's, let's buckle in and, and relive this ride all over again. Yeah, it was kind of like uh, people watching the Titanic. You yeah. know that there's going to be a massive accident at the end, but you just watch because eh, it's fun. Yeah. But as Habs fans, I mean, Habs fans tend to, uh, in this case, be cheering for the iceberg. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> doubt. I don't think uh, my father-in-law, like I said, is a Habs fan. I don't think he'll watch it. I told him, it's, you know, he might, he might enjoy it. I think maybe just for that final episode, but uh, yeah. we'll see. I'm going to go out on a limb and say most non-Leaf fans probably won't watch it because we're already bombarded with enough Leaf coverage throughout the year. Uh, maybe that there's going to be a camera there when they're at Red Lobster or something in a few days, <laughs> or whether they're like right now they're in Muskoka at somebody's cabin. Yeah. So, so maybe there'll be a camera there. Um, I guess we'll wait and see, or maybe we'll hear more about uh, how this new cross-checking breakdown is going to help the Leafs win the cup. Like, yeah. There's always, there's always a new angle. There's, there's always going to be story. something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, as a Habs podcast, we'll, uh, we'll shift over to a couple of little Habs tidbits. And today, as we record, it's the 7th of uh, October. Uh, Carey Price came out. Uh, it was announced today that he is entering the, uh, the NHL's assistance program. So he's out for at least 30 days. And from his wife's uh, Instagram post, it seems it's all based on mental health. So Mm -hmm. how, how do you, what's your view of the impact of these big name players, these stars in the game, seeking the help and making it known that they, they are struggling and that there is help. I think it's, I think it's obviously an important time. Um, I think that we've seen obviously over the last number of years that a lot of these, you know, big name players have, have come forward and, and I think devolved some of the struggles they've had. And I think obviously recently with Jonathan Duran as well, like that's another thing where I think that a lot of people can relate to that. And I think that that is, it only does good things, I think, for ending the stigma around mental health challenges. I think obviously, you know, it's a tough loss for the Canadians, you know, to lose him again, along with, I think the injury that he was battling back from as well. And certainly this kind of, Let's him back, but I think if he's able to get obviously the help you know that he needs, um, I think that's nothing that that can only be a good thing. And I think what also kind of brought it home uh, was I saw that you know his wife Angela shared something on Instagram where you know Carrie made this decision to not only help himself but help his family, right? Because at the end of the day, like there's these athletes live a whole nother life and they have their own families, right? And I think that mental health is something that not only affects you, you know, it affects the people that you live with and the people you love and the people who care about you. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a courageous thing for him to do that. And again, I hope that he's able to get the help that he needs and that he's back on the ice, you know, healthy and in the right frame of mind uh, in the very near future, but certainly uh, wouldn't obviously want to rush that process. Want to make sure that he gets, you know, all, all the treatment that he needs to, to get back to being himself, uh, you know, for his wife and his kids. And, and in the same press conference, uh, Mark, it was, it was announced that Mark Bergevin is not going to be negotiating a contract throughout the season this being his final year, um, what, what do you think is going through the mind of uh, Molson when he's, he, he's looking at a lame duck GM in his final year in, in Montreal? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I did catch that, that tidbit that kind of obviously I think was like a, a footnote. And I think what the, the more important part of that press conference was Um but yeah, it's, it's kind of, and you think back, like he's been there for, for such a long time. You just wonder, um, you know, maybe is this, is this, is this the end? Obviously they had an incredible run last year. Um, I think you could argue that if, the, if they didn't go on the run that they did, maybe that might've been the end. Um, it's possible, but we'll never know that now. Cause I think certainly he, I think ensured that he would be coming back and ultimately, you know, I think could, uh, you know, want to want to extend that contract further whether or not it's just kind of something he does, he's saying that now because he wants to focus on what's happening this season, especially in light of, of what's happened today, um, that he certainly has maybe bigger things to worry about. But, uh, but yeah, I think it'll be interesting, you know, to see what happens at the end of the year if he decides to hang them up um, or, or if maybe it's just something they're going to hash out in the offseason. It's, it's just a way to kind of, you know, keep the, 
keep the focus off of him and, you know, and focus on, I think what's more important. Now, if you were, I'm going to put you, put yourself in the shoes of a guy who's in the last year of a contract who might be trying to get another contract. Um, what would you do when your star goaltender is out for the minimum of a month, maybe longer, and your team has several other injuries? What, what would you do to fix or kind of allow this team to tread water at the start of the year? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's almost kind of like a, I guess, kind of a bit of a freedom that comes with having such a, like a short leash because, you know, if you're in the, the first year of a five-year deal uh, and you start to make some rash decisions, um, you end up hamstringing yourself in the, ne- in the coming years, right? Just to keep your team above water. Maybe those moves help you kind of stay afloat, but over time, you know, they maybe weren't the, the best long-term fits, but because this is his last year um, and, you know, whether he's leaving or, you know, he's, he's going to go to another team or he's going to try to hash out an extension in the, in the off season, you know, I think this is an opportunity again for him to showcase what he can do. Um, again, if he's able to make some shrewd moves that allow the team to stay competitive in the absence of some of these key players, and that obviously bodes well for a possible extension in Montreal, but also <laughs> for another club that's looking to bring in, you know, a, a, a GM of Bergevin's caliber. So I think there's almost kind of like, you kind of can really, you know, do whatever, right. Because you're either coming back or you're not. Um, I think in, anybody who's going to look at another GM is going to look at their entire body of work and not necessarily what happened at the start of the season. Um, so I think it could get interesting uh, depending on how, I guess, aggressive he wants to go, or if he tries to play it safe, knowing that, you know, he still has, you know, a, a lot of years ahead of him potentially as the GM. The tying in the uh, Canadians back with the Kings, Philip Deneau leaves Montreal for an extra 500k a year and goes to the Kings on a six-year deal. Um, what are your thoughts on the deal itself? And uh, what do you think he's going to bring to the table in uh, Los Angeles? Yeah, I mean, I, I like the deal. I think what the Kings did this offseason is, is great. Um, I think they're obviously at the most pivotal part of their rebuild, which is transitioning out of the actual rebuilding and then getting back into contention mode. Um, you could obviously tell that with the players they've added in Deneau and Arvidsson, like these are experienced players who I think bring a lot to the team. Um, obviously up the middle, having Deneau there with, with Kopitar um, is huge. Uh, I think that's a great one-two punch. And then obviously I think also even with Arvidsson, this is a player who is not that far removed from a 30-goal season or he had two 30-goal seasons in Nashville. So I think, um, you know, they're both both determined to bring something to the lineup. I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see how that works because I think certainly now with the influx of those veteran players uh, who I think, you know, kind of complement the, the other veteran core group that they have, that I think there is a bit of an expectation now that they will contribute, obviously, um, but also help the Kings get back into the playoff picture. Um, I think there's obviously been some, and it's not even been that, that long of a rebuild. They were obviously, you know, in the playoffs in 2018, but I think to get back into, into full contention mode, this is kind of what we're, what we've been building towards. Um, And so I think that they'll definitely do well in that role, hopefully shepherding that younger group of players through as well as I think maybe some of the older veterans ahead of them start to age out and maybe find homes in the next, you know, season or two. Uh, But yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a great move. It seems like he's really embraced Los Angeles. I think he'll be a good fit there. And, you know, unfortunately for you guys, I, I look forward to seeing him in, uh, you know, in, in black and silver uh, this year. Uh, purple and gold. There's not going to be any of the third Jersey stuff this year. I th- yeah, I think that's good. I think that's coming back. Um, I would prefer, I mean, last year was, was my favorite uh, with the reverse retro, obviously getting, you know, the Chevy era logo, which I think, you know, as, as a kid that grew up in the nineties, like that was the, yeah. you know, even I was a Leafs fan, like that was still the, the best looking Jersey out there in my mind, you know, just to get that combo with the, with the purple and gold was, was perfect. I wish that would be their full time, um, you know, look like there's no other color combination like that in the NHL certainly set them apart. But, uh, but yeah, even if we get a little bit of it, that's, that's enough for me, but I'd like to see more of it. I mean, I don't know any nineties kid who didn't have, a two-piece silver Easton or a Kings Jersey with Gretzky on the back. I mean, it was just one of those things. Yeah. And uh, you know, for me, uh, my dad uh, grew up in, in Onaping, um, which is just, well, Blaine, you'd probably know this, but yeah. it's, you know, 40 minutes uh, North of Sudbury and uh, Dave Taylor just grew, grew up in nearby uh, Levac. And so they went to the same high school, Levac high. So like the Kings were always kind of a thing in our house because Dave Taylor was from Levac and, you know, he obviously went on to be, 
you know, one of the greatest players in Kings history from this small little mining town north of Sudbury. So, you know, obviously I'd like to say that it was Wayne Gretzky who was the central figure, but I think, you know, you had Dave Taylor yeah. as a close second just because of the, you know, the family uh, connection there. Yeah, I do remember seeing a few Taylor jerseys when I was you know, younger too. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, being a Sudbury kid, that was, that was pretty normal. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Speaking of which, you also have a podcast, but it's not hockey related. No, it's not. Uh, it's it's work related, actually. Yeah. So it, it's about uh, it's about a little bit of mining in there. I understand. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it's called the Unlikely Innovators, and I started it uh, with my good friend and colleague Steve Gravel, who uh, he's the manager of of a research hub that we have here at Cambria that focuses on on facilitating technology adoption in the mining in, mining industry, and so. What we wanted to do with that podcast is the world that we work in is still kind of ke- uh, best kept secret in Canada. We do what is known as applied research, where we help companies, you know, take the research that's being done at the university level and then use that to solve a practical problem. Oftentimes, this involves like a prototype development for a process improvement. And uh, like we obviously know the virtues of applied research because we see how it helps companies, we see how it helps our students. But by and large, like the general public doesn't know about applied research. And I mean, truthfully, I didn't know what applied research was until I started working at Cambrian uh, five years ago. So I think most people could be forgiven for not knowing that. So what we wanted to do was kind of do a podcast to kind of talk about that. Uh, so we, you know, we spent the first few episodes just kind of riffing on, on what we do and, and why it's important. And then we've been bringing on guests who we think fit the mold of the unlikely innovator. They either had an interesting career path um, or they work for a company that's had kind of a different trajectory. Uh, and obviously, I think a lot of the guests we've had on have had a mining, uh, you know, slant to them. It's Sudbury. And so obviously, that's, you know, still the, the top industry here. Uh, but it's been awesome. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Obviously, I get the chance to come on, you know, great podcasts like this and talk to you guys. But it's, uh, it's a whole different animal when, when you're in the driver's seat. And it's, it's up to you to make sure that, you know, the recording goes well. You know, the editing is there, although we have a great uh, producer at, at school that works with us. So he's great. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a blast. Uh, you know, it's, I, I think over the years, I've, I've toyed with the idea of starting a hockey podcast, but again, it comes down to the time, right? Every podcast you record potentially eats into an article you could write. Uh, so at least if you have a work-related podcast, you can record your episodes during the day um, and kind of chalk it up as a, as a business meeting and then obviously release them whenever you want. So, so it's just a way to get out of the office. <laughs> well, I mean, well, we haven't even got out of the office yet, to be honest. You know, it's, it's funny because people keep asking, like, when can we do a live podcast? Um, we've just been doing the Zoom thing for a bit. We've got a nice like microphone that we're hoping to take for a spin, you know, in the near future where we'll have people in an office with us. But for now, uh, we're obviously kind of abiding by uh, the protocols our college has in place. And so everything's been done by Zoom. Um, but maybe hopefully in the winter into the spring, uh, we'll be able to kind of be out, be out in the wild uh, doing uh, doing podcasts on the fly. So it's essentially it's just for our listeners who are more hockey related it's the advanced stats of the industry that's basically what it is yeah i I would say so with a with a bit of the you know we like to try to yuck it up a little bit from time to time so i think you get like a pretty informative view of of like where we're situated in the sector and then the guests that we have on are certainly much smarter than we are and so i think they carry the show for us and then steve and i try to just you know and inject our own personalities and I think commentary into it to make it, I think, digestible, right? So I think that we like to pride ourselves on, on I think kind of, uh, you know, going at that higher level but making it accessible so that everybody can understand, which I think is key, uh, you know, whether it's in hockey or whether it's in our sector in hockey, that again, it's great to have all of that information and that data, but if you can't, you know, convey that in a way that's meaningful, that could be understood by the masses, then it's just, it's just numbers, right? Yeah. Uh, and and I, I only brought it up because I, being someone who grew up in Sudbury, I have a mining engineering degree. So I kind of nerd out a little bit on it when I (laughs) I get the chance. So it was my one chance. Absolutely. (laughs) Not a lot of mining going on over here in, uh, in Halifax and the Navy. So I took my shot. Um, I appreciate it. (laughs) Matt, did you, you had a question, didn't you? Going back to hockey. (laughs) Cause I do not have a mining degree. Uh, um, well, neither do I, so it's all good. <laughs> so when it comes to the youth of the Kings, um, they've got, uh, they've got uh, Byfield, who's now unfortunately injured. You've got Valerity, who drafted a few years ago, but he's had a little bit of issues staying healthy. And now mm-hmm. you've got a guy like Kaliev. 
Um, do you think any of these guys are going to really take that next step and uh, into the lineup this season and then maybe be game breakers for the uh, Kings rebuild? Yeah, I think that's certainly the expectation. I think even Turcotte, obviously now with, you know, with Byfield out of the lineup, I think there's, you know, there's the potential there uh, you know, lower in the lineup down the middle. Uh, but I think, you know, as, as we're, as we're talking, I think last night there was an arty party. Cali have got a, a hat trick to, to power the Kings to that comeback. Um, so I think that, you know, certainly that is definitely the expectation. Um, you know, Cali is another player who I've, you know, had the chance to see live a couple of times as they kind of passed through in Sudbury, but certainly somebody I'll be keeping a closer eye on now. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's kind of the, 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 I guess the fun, but also kind of, you know, um, not unnerving part, but now you've got all of these young players. They're certainly not all going to make, uh, make the team and they're not all going to make those, those next steps at the same time. But I think if they're able to balance out, um, you know, the influx of those veteran players that we talked about earlier and have these guys take that next step in their development, like that's what's going to fuel that next, next, that next stage of the rebuild. Right. And so um, I think that when you saw a lot of these guys playing pro last year, um, you know, they got that experience under their belt. And now it's just a matter of trying to convert it over to NHL. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see what Cali can do if he sticks around um, because again, he's got a wicked shot and uh, loves scoring goals. So it'll be, he's, I think he's a fun guy that could add a lot of, uh, you know, levity to that team. Well, uh, I think we can, I think we covered quite a bit. Um, I know that you were recently on Ian McLaren's uh, Locked on Bruins show and you guys talked about the beef and bird. So this mm -hmm. is my Sudbury nerd out moment here again. So uh, I would, I would refrain from going to the beef and bird. If anyone's listening, go down the street <laughs> to the nickel city Inn, ask for a guy named Marcel. It's my father. He'll hook you up much better bar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do that now though. Now, now that I know who I'm looking for, I'm going to go up and, and, and talk to him. That's right. Way better. Less Bruin <laughs> stuff too. As it's Chicago. I, I can stuff, appreciate but... that. I can appreciate that. It's still Chicago Blackhawk stuff, but it's not the Bruins. Um, yeah. But no, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking some time out and, and coming here and chatting hockey and helping me nerd out with my mining stuff. I, I do appreciate yeah. that very much. Oh, no, I appreciate you guys having me on again. I always appreciate the chance to talk about the book and talk hockey and, and again, talk subbery and mining. So thanks again. <laughs> uh, just to, just a reminder for our list, for our listeners, could you, give them an idea of where to find your stuff. Yeah. So you can primarily find me on Twitter. I'm at Mike Camito. Um, that's where I'll post any articles I do for the Kings or the Wolves. Uh, also post where you can find the book on Twitter, but obviously, as we mentioned earlier, pick up a copy of Pocket 365, the second period. Um, you can find it wherever you like to get books, Amazon chapters or your local booksellers. Again, thank you. Thank you very much for coming on the show. And, uh, Best of luck with the sales. Uh, I know at least two people bought them here on this show. That's great. I appreciate it, guys. Every sale counts. And for our listeners, remember, if you were talking about it, so are we. <laughs>